Hey and welcome back to XYZ. This time we are going to look at some vector math. I have to say I'm not an expert in any way about this, but I will try my best to give you an idea of what the different vector functions are doing. If you know more about this topic and you catch me talking garbage at any point in the video, please let me know in the comments so I can correct the video. Even though I will be using Blender for visualization purposes, the knowledge is applicable across a magnitude of different software. I hope I can shine some light on this rather complex topic, and let's head over into Blender and see what we can find out. So here we are in Blender, and right away I bring in a UV sphere to help us visualize some of the vector math and let's see our location in x y and c is zero right now since we're sitting right in the scene center let's increase our x position by five and instantly we have done some vector math we added five units to the exposition of our sphere object. So in reality, everyone who has used Blender before has done vector math without even realizing it just by positioning, rotating and scaling objects. We just don't think about it being vector math, we just do it. But our vector can not only be seen as a single point in 3D space, but it can also be seen as giving us a direction. So if we imagine a line going from the scene center out and through our vector, that is our sphere, then we see there is an imaginary line that we can actually work with. And some of the vector functions that we are looking at later will use vectors not as position, but as direction. So this is something to think of when we look at the vector functions later. So let's head over into the geometry node editor and we bring in a transform node. And we will use some empties as an A vector. And B vector that we will use to do some math and actually visualize all of it in the 3D viewport of Blender. So the sphere becomes our result. And to bring in our vectors we use the object info node. And we, of course, need a vector math node. So let's work in a single axis for now. So we add five here and let's make sure we center our sphere object since this is important where the pivot is of our object and right away we see we just added five units to the x location of our vector that starts at zero since a is zero and let's pin that so it doesn't disappear when i click something else <laughs> 
our vector b is exactly the same position as our result since 0 plus 5 in the x direction is exactly 5 in x and our result is showing that so all of add subtract multiply and divide don't work any differently than they work for single values they're just the base math functions that we already are familiar with you just have to make sure to realize that we can also use negative values in our addition and subtraction and that of course will play a role in the result but this is also true for doing math with negative single numbers and not only vectors. So let's do the absolute. This one will only take in a single vector. And right away it seems like this is outputting the opposite, but in reality this is outputting the positive result of our input vector so if our vector is all positive numbers the result is following along perfectly but the moment we go negative in any axis our sphere will still move positively and when we have only negative numbers in all axes the sphere will still be positive in all three axes. So absolute will always return the positive result of the input vector, no matter if the incoming vector is negative or positive. Then we have the minimum function. And there we have two vectors again and we see that our result is following perfectly again until we hit a certain point where it can't move across and we see that that is specified by our b vector. This seems to be like a corner. And we have uh, to imagine a volume that is stretching out in three directions. And our result can't move outside of these boundaries that are defined by the vector b. Then let's head on to the maximum. This one will be the exact opposite of the minimum function. Right away we see this behaves pretty much the same, but our volume is the exact opposite it goes out like this and our result can't move past these imaginary this imaginary volume that the vector b is defining Then we have the floor. This one also takes only a single vector in. And let's center our A vector. And I start to move it 
in the x direction. And right away we see that our vector is just rounded down to the next full unit. So this is snapping our vector to the next full unit and is rounding down. Ceiling is then doing the exact opposite. It rounds up. So 2.47 becomes a full three units. Then the fraction is getting rid of whole numbers. So 2.47 becomes just 0 0.47. And if I move across another full number, it just starts at zero again and moves back up to one and is doing that constantly as I move along the x-axis. So it returns everything that is after the comma and everything before the comma is completely ignored. Then we have the modulo function which will also take in two vectors. And let's make a a 9 and b a 2. And it seems like the result is a 1. And the reason for that is modulo returns the remainder of a division. So it divides a 9 by 2 and since we only get to 8 and then you can't divide it any further it returns the remainder of 1. So if we would switch our a vector to 8 the modulo would be 0. And the same thing happens when we switch to 10, because 10 and 8 can be perfectly divided by 2, but everything in between cannot. We can use that to our advantage. And we already see that this isn't that is very similar to the fraction, but we can actually define at what point our result starts to move uh, from zero back up to our specified number. But it is behaving similar, so if I make this a one and start moving, then it behaves pretty much like the fraction function. But in case of modulo, I can make the b vector whatever I want. And I'm not constrained to the 0 and 1 range like the fraction function does. Then we move on to wrap. And right away we see that we now have a max and min input. So in total, we have three vectors that we can input. So let's duplicate our empty and we create another vector that we can use. And when we move our a vector, we see what is happening the moment it hits our defined uh, border of the volume. It starts over on the 
opposite side. So we can, in fact, constrain our uh, vector into this imaginary volume by using a minimum and maximum vector. And our result will always stay inside of these bounds. Then we have the snap. And this snaps our A vector based on the B vector. So since our B vector is 2, it starts to snap in increments of 2 units. So if I start to move, the moment I hit 2 units, the result follows along and in between nothing is happening and of course i can change that to whatever i want if i would set it to zero then the vector was the wrong one we have too many vectors right now it seems if i make that a zero the b vector then the output will always be zero it will not snap to anything anymore so you have to be careful the b vector does actually have to have a value other than zero or otherwise whatever you are uh, running into this function will return zero unless that is exactly what you want but this way we can completely define at what point our a vector is snapping and this is also very useful for uh, rotations since you can also just specify a number of degree to which the object should snap so you can snap in 10 degrees 45 degrees 90 degrees whatever you want this function is perfect for that to continue this i will switch over to animation nodes since some of the more advanced functions are easier to explain and show with animation nodes rather than geometry nodes. But let's keep geometry nodes around. We create a new node tree in animation nodes and we don't output our vector math into our result anymore since we will be doing that in animation nodes now. And we move on to normalize that we have right here. We see there's a little bit of this difference since we have a length value in animation nodes. I will just set that to one since that is exactly what geometry nodes does. It normalizes a vector to have a length of one. But geometry nodes is a bit more advanced since I can just specify a certain length that I want the vector to have. But we can achieve the same result by just doing a normalize and then using 
the scale function later on that will lead to the same effect. So we want our vectors in here. And for this, we only need a single vector that we normalize. And I will output the result for now as the B vector and not as the sphere anymore, since we will use the sphere to see how the vector moves. And right away we see that when I move our A vector, the B vector is following, but it is now normalized to a length of one. So in this case, it seems to be following the surface of our sphere perfectly, since our sphere has dimension of two units. So the radius of our sphere is one. And what normalize does is it looks at our A vector, not as a position, but as a direction, and then limits its direction to one unit coming out from the scene center. And that is why the B vector is following the surface of the sphere perfectly. And in animation node, I have the option to increase the length of the vector. So now it is a full two units away from the scene center in every case. So we move on and let's look at the scale. And with a scale of one, our result follows our A vector perfectly. But when we start to increase the scale, it starts to move away from the vector and it moves away in an imaginary line again, based on the direction that the input vector is giving us. So wherever we move that, we have to envision our imaginary line that comes from the scene center and goes through our input vector. And based on that, our result is scaled on that imaginary line. And we have a distance function. In animation node, that is a separate node. We'll also take in two vectors. And it will return a single value and not a vector anymore. So let's visualize this with a simple viewer node. And what this is outputting is the distance between vector A and B. So we can, I can visualize that as a spline so we can see it. <laughs> 
and right here. This is what the distance outputs. No matter where our vectors are, it will output the distance between the two. And the next one is the length, which is similar, but it only inputs a single vector. So we will use just A. And to visualize that, this will look something like this. And no matter where our A vector is, the length is calculated by starting from the scene center and then going to our vector. So instead of giving out the distance between two vectors, we get the distance from the scene center to our one vector. So let's continue with some more advanced vector functions like the dot product. I will delete the spline that we created before. And the dot product is also a separate node in animation nodes. And you could achieve the same thing what the dot product node does by just separating our vectors into its components and then multiplying both of our x, y, and c values and then adding all three of them together. That would get you the dot product. And if you're interested in any of the formulas behind the vector math, or the vector functions. I will drop a link to the Blender documentation and the documentation of geometry nodes in specific in uh, the description below so you can actually look at that. And what a dot product is often used for is to find uh, the angle between two vectors. So if we would imagine a triangle based on our two vectors, we would want to find out what this angle is. And this is what a dot product is used for. In this case, we also need the vector length node and the vector length function. And with some other math nodes, we would just multiply the length or the magnitude, as it is also called, of both of our vectors. Remember, the length is from here to here and again from here to here the value these vectors have and that we can divide with each other so we grab the dot product and divide by our multiplication 
and then we would run that through an arc cosine function which probably deserves its own video and this will be the angle between these two vectors in radians so the output is in radians and not degrees and oftentimes uh, there are actually separate nodes for stuff like that since there is a vector angle node in animation nodes that does exactly the same without needing all of the extra nodes but since uh, this node is not available in geometry nodes or not yet you could recreate this vector angle node by just doing the math separately so let's get rid of all of this and we will continue to do the cross product let's output that into our result again and we will bring in a plane to visualize better what the cross product does so i need another transform output node so i can transform our plane And let's make that plane a bit bigger and to see what is happening when I now move our two vectors this will angle a plane so the plane we will have to normally imagine but the two vectors are on a plane and our new vector that is generated by the cross product is perpendicular to our two vectors so if we want to find a new vector that is perpendicular that is 90 degree angle from our other two vectors then we would use a cross product So this angle right here is 90 degrees and it comes off from our imaginary plane that is created by our two vectors that we input into the cross product function. So we move on to project and let's get rid of our plane for now and to visualize that we want another spline is probably best 
and here we have the project function. So you have to imagine a line that, so the B vector is again used as a direction. So you have a line from our scene center to our B vector. And wherever that line spans, the A vector is projected onto it. Wherever I move our A vector, it is projected onto this imaginary line that spans because of our B vector. So even if we move across where the line is visible, if we expand that, our result will always stay on this imaginary line, no matter where we move our A vector. Then we move on to reflect. And I can get rid of our spline again. And let's look what this does. We have to set this to reflect as well. And this should make it a bit clearer. So we have another imaginary plane in this case, and the imaginary plane becomes, uh, gets its direction that it's angled towards from our B vector. So this imaginary plane is always looking into direction of vector b and the vector a is actually reflected based on this imaginary plane no matter where the a vector moves our result will always be the opposite based on this imaginary plane this is what the reflection function does Then we have refract, and this is a function that is not in animation nodes, but is in geometry nodes. So this is also something that you will encounter. Not every program or not every add-on will have all of the functions available. And let's see how we can visualize that in the best. So let's output the result in geometry nodes. And let's see what that does. So this is very similar to our reflect. but it will always stay on the opposite of where our imaginary plane is looking at. The moment our vector goes in the direction the plane is looking at, it is reflected. And when we are in the opposite direction, the vector follows our input perfectly. So that is the difference of reflection and refraction.
So refraction is one-sided, whereas the reflection works in both directions. So what we haven't talked about yet is the sine, cosine and tangent functions. Let's clean out the scene a bit. Get rid of the stuff we don't need anymore. Let's grab our A vector. Move it in the X direction. And right away we see that we get some bounce effect, no matter how far we go. We never exceed negative one and positive one, so we bounce between those two values. And the same happens for the Y direction. and the C direction. And animation notes doesn't have a vector math function for sine, cosine and tangent, just a regular math function, but we can still use that and just run the sine function on every direction independently. So for every axis we have, we just run the sine. And then we combine the vector again. And we output that into our result. And when we move our A vector, it should move the same way as geometry nodes did. And it looks like it does. Every direction we have the sine wave going on. And this, these five nodes are the same as the single node in geometry nodes. But the cool thing about animation nodes is we don't have to uh, use the same function, but we can just go with a sine and cosine and we drive that with the x direction, and when we do that, we see that our object suddenly moves around the center in a perfect circle. And that is what the sine, cosine, and tangent functions are used for. You can create uh, circles with these functions. And they're also perfect to move objects very smoothly between two values and let them bounce. That's why uh, sine functions are often used in uh, motion graphics. Because you instantly get a very interesting animation from it by just, we just moving our vector linearly and still the animation has this bounce to it, which makes sine and cosine functions very interesting to use. And we can also visualize how the sine and cosine look one-dimensionally. So we 
distribute some a matrix and instead of using our a vector we just use the vectors from this node and we use the sign in the c position and let's get this node out of the way and we create another spline from these vectors And here is the beginning of our sine wave that we are generating. And we want to increase the number of our points. Doesn't seem to be updating. And so we accidentally got rid of the object in here. And the sine, cosine, and tangent functions use radians to generate the movement. So a uh, whole zero, one, negative zero, zero transition happens in the span of two pi. So two times pi, which is 6.28. And you see by that time, a whole sine wave is complete and it starts over again. So the number pi is pretty much half of a sine wave or cosine wave. Tau is two times pi. And here we see uh, the cosine starts at a positive one then moves down to negative one and then ends at a positive one again it's shifted from what the sine function returns and if we look at the tangent it does something like this But since we already know that they're used to create circles, we can actually recreate this. And when we use a sine and a cosine, we create this perfect circle around here. And depending on which axis we feed in, It creates the direction in which the circle is created. And we are using uh, the x-axis to drive this since we are distributing our original points along the x-axis. So if we just look at our initial points, they run along the x-axis and by just using the x-axis and running a sine function and a cosine and then inputting them into the x and y direction, we suddenly get this perfect circle. And right there we see when we put in pi, we get a half circle. So 2 times pi is necessary to get the whole circle and also finish a whole section of a sine wave or a cosine wave. But we could also do a quarter circle. Like that. Or pretty much 
move it around. And the vector math function in geometry nodes does pretty much the same thing, just with every axis independently. And one more thing to keep in mind is let's uh, do a multiply and add. It makes a difference depending on if you change your value before the sine function or if you run your multiply and add after the sine function. So when we multiply before, you increase the speed. And when you add before the sine function, you offset horizontally. And when you multiply after the sine function, you increase its uh, amplitude. And the add will just shift it vertically. So this is something to keep in mind when working with sine, cosine, and tangents. This concludes the introduction to vector math. If your head is on fire right now from all the information, I take no responsibility, but please let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. If you have any suggestions for future tutorials, don't hesitate to put them in the comments as well. Like, share and subscribe and I'd love to see you all next time. Happy blending!